Welcome to module number seven. This is Holistic Herd Health, Prevention Programs, and How to Treat Sick Cows. My name is Cindy Daly. I'm with the California State University at Chico, where I supervise an organic dairy program for the College of Agriculture. What we plan to cover in this module are the essential components of an effective herd health program. We'll talk about how vaccinations work to prevent disease and what a common vaccination program would look like for an organic dairy herd. We'll also get into integrated pest management for both internal and external parasites, talk about mineral supplementation and how crucial that is for a solid herd health program. We'll also talk about common diseases and approved methods for treating those diseases in an organic dairy herd. Required reading for this module includes the article by Linda Tukowski on organic dairy herd health. That particular article was taken from the NOFA New York Handbook on Organic Dairy Production. It's very good. Also read the Integrated Pest Management Guide for Organic Dairies. It was a publication that was put together uh, specifically for organic dairies by Cornell University. We'd also like you to watch a video entitled The Holistic Herd Health, Your Organic Dairy Herd Health Toolbox by Dr. Hugh Carriman. It's a great video that's been archived on the eOrganic website. Opening this module with this particular quote by Benjamin Franklin is very appropriate. It, it goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and it couldn't be more appropriate, more spot on for organic dairy production. It's critical that we create a very robust immune system so that many of these issues um, related to disease and treatment of that disease are, are moot. We want to try and prevent so that we don't have to go to the expense, time, labor, and all of that that's associated with the treatments. Because we realize that in the organic system, we don't have the powerful, potent tools to try and fix problems. So the key is to prevent them. Organic dairy herd health is based on a holistic philosophy where the soil, the environment, nutrition, animal health, animal well-being are all integrated into a unified system. The conventional farming method is more of a reductionist approach you know, to health, where a disease occurs in an organ or a system, and then that disease area is the target for examination or for a specific treatment. And the rest of the body is you know, just kind of along for the ride. Organic farmers and organic veterinarians use a, a different approach, and they look at the animal as an integrated unit that is part of a whole ecosystem in which it lives. When disease becomes a problem on organic farms, the farmer cannot just look at the symptoms of a sick animal, but must consider the symptoms of the farm as well. What's lacking in the soil health? What's lacking in the nutrition or the housing and the management that is predisposing this animal to disease? Herd health statistics are usually very indicative of management. If there's a break in any link in your management chain, it's going to show up as a blemish in your herd health statistics. I think it's important to realize that, you know, organic farming is not about substituting one organically approved product for a conventional product that we're used to using. Um, I love this quote from Harriet Bahar, an organic specialist with Moses. She says, organic production isn't about substituting approved products for chemical products. Organic is about managing your system for maximum soil health, plant and animal health, so that you don't need to use very many products or any off-farm inputs. So how do we build this preventative herd health program? Well, much of the prevention is really based upon three very important factors on farm. One is a high forage diet, making sure that you're maximizing your pasture DMI in your herd. Secondarily is your grazing program, what kind of a grazing um, system that you have um, on farm and how well it's working with your resource base and your cow herd. Third, it's your soil mineralization and soil biology. Just where are you, where are you going, um, how close are you to having optimized uh, both your soil profile and your soil biology. All of these things contribute to a very robust herd health program. When we do have problems, these are some of the items that might be in your organic dairy toolbox for herd health. <clears throat> Vitamins and minerals, of course, they're fed as, as a preventative in the feed. They can also be used as an injectable, as a type of dry cow treatment, or in the face of a, as a type of disease. There's a few allowed synthetics, which we'll discuss in more detail as we move into the module. Vaccines and other biologicals are, are typically allowed. 
herbs and plants and other botanicals are very common in organic dairy herd health programs. There are some topicals that can be used that are made out of essential oils, whey products such as colostrum and, and cytokine enriched um, serums, antioxidants, and of course homeopathy. All of these are examples of tools that might be in an organic dairy herd health program. One of the mainstays within an organic program are tinctures. Tinctures are alcohol or glycerin based extracts from plants. The alcohol or the glycerin absorb the many beneficial molecules from within the plant tissue itself that have the many medicinal properties in a very concentrated form. One of the examples that I have here for you is a CEG, which is a, a combination of cayenne, echinacea, garlic, and apple cider vinegar. And that's used typically for upper respiratory type ailments. Tinctures are based on the uh, extraction of plant secondary metabolites, or PSMs, from plant tissues. And we can do that because we know that the plants produce a variety of PSMs, a whole host of different types that have been produced by the plant, essentially to protect itself from disease or from predation. We utilize these compounds uh, for their medicinal qualities once they're known. For example, garlic. A tincture that's prepared from garlic would contain in it um, allicillin. Allicillin along with 28 other active compounds that have antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial type activities. But allicillin would be just one of those PSMs. It has an antibacterial quality about it, so it can be used as a natural, organically approved antibiotic. In addition to tinctures and botanicals, we also have another alternative type treatment called homeopathy. Homeopathy was first developed in Western Europe. It's based on the treatment of the law of similars, or like treating like. The concept is similar to conventional vaccinations, where a small amount of dead or live bacteria is introduced into the body to stimulate the body's immune response basically helping the body to do the real disease fighting in the system. With homeopathy, a remedy is prepared to match symptoms of the disease that the animal or human is experiencing. And there you have the law of similars. And if this remedy is given in sufficient quantity and with adequate repetition, it will create and therefore cure those same symptoms simultaneously. It's a very different approach from conventional medicine where you're given a drug to counteract, relieve, or block a symptom. Instead, this is the situation where you're given a substance that's going to create those same symptoms. Uh, remedies are extremely dilute um, and shaken or succussed in the uh, homeopathy term at each step of the dilution process. Uh, these dilute remedies uh, are used to treat symptoms that the original product would have created. So the more dilute a remedy, the greater its potency in actuality. These dilutions are administered as a liquid or by a lactose sphere or pellet onto which the, the homeopathy company would have sprayed the remedy. So the remedy would be adhered to the uh, small lactose pellet. The liquid or tablet remedy are placed in contact with mucous membranes in the mouth, nasal passages, or possibly the vulva, depending upon on what the um, remedy is. And typically these remedies are administered more frequently. They can be administered up to six times a day, early, preferably early in the disease process, and then are tapered down as those symptoms regress. One common remedy that's used within the organic dairy industry is phytolaca. Phytolaca causes inflammation of the mammary gland and creates very similar symptoms to mastitis as clinical mastitis would due to um, infectious organisms like you know, staph or strep. So phytolaca would be administered um, over a period of time in the early stages of a mastitis case in the uh, anticipation of relieving those symptoms and reversing the disease process. Another alternative treatment would include essential oils. Essential oils are a concentrated hydrophobic liquid that contains the volatile aroma compounds that are extracted or distilled from plant material. Essential oils are also known as volatile oils, the ethereal oils, or simply as the oil of the plant from which it's extracted, such as the oil of clove. 
And oil is essential um, in the sense that it carries a very distinctive scent or essence of the plant. They are very potent and can be extremely effective when used in the proper context. For example, melaleuca or eucalyptus work wonders on hairy footwort. Um, Mullinin leaf oils are also good for respiratory type problems. Aloe vera is another excellent tool that uh, you need to have in your organic dairy toolbox. Uh, the juice of the aloe vera plant is used as an immune stimulant uh, because it basically can override the effects of uh, stress on the immune system. We all know that cortisol and stress is very suppressive to the immune system. Well, aloe vera has the ability to, to override that effect. As a topical application, aloe vera may be very useful in the treatment of burns and minor skin infections. I know I have been using aloe vera for decades on sunburns um, with my kids and myself. The healing properties are really due to compounds such as the mucopolysaccharides, the mannins, the anthroquinones, and the lectins that are found within the juice of the aloe vera plant. Colostral whey products that are produced from colostrum from hyper-vaccinated cows is another immune-stimulating type product that can be used in the face of an infection. The product is usually uh, pasteurized to prevent the spread of disease and it does contain a lot of antibodies or immunoglobulins and other immunologically active proteins like the lymphokines, the cytokines, the lactoferrin and enzymes that basically are there to stimulate the immune system. It must be produced from an organically certified cow if it's to be used in an organic dairy herd. So make sure that you check all of these products with your certifier to make sure that they are suitable for an organic herd. Another big broad classification that is used frequently within um, the organic dairy industry are the botanicals. Uh, they are the oldest. Most of those date back thousands of years. Many of the allopathic medicines that we have today are originated from botanical type therapies. Botanicals are actual plant products that can be ingested orally and used in a poultice or brewed up in a tea. So these would be different than what we had talked about previously with the tinctures and the essential oils. These are the actual plant products themselves, not the extracts of. For example, mullein leaf can be dried and prepared as a tea. Mullein has an expectorant type quality to it, um, which stimulates the cilia of the trachea to bring up fluids and that type of thing. So it's often used to treat respiratory disease. You might even want to try that for yourself because it is quite effective. Now we've already talked about aloe vera, but you know here's a, a list of other commonly used botanicals, such as black cohosh, which is used for reproductive disorders that type of thing. You have to be careful with black cohosh because it can cause some liver toxicities. Black walnut, the holes from the black walnut specifically are used to control internal parasites. Burdock has been used as a blood cleanser or as a diuretic. A cayenne pepper, uh, basically the ground fruit of the cayenne pepper has been used to stimulate local uh, circulation, uh, to control pain, used as an antimicrobial. Chamomile, the flower heads of the chamomile plant have been used to correct digestive disorders. It can be a mild sedative. Comfrey is used as a poultice for wounds when you have some kind of a skin a wound or an acute mastitis where a teat injury is at cause. A comfrey poultice will go a long way to, to healing that. Dandelion leaves and roots can be used as a cleansing tonic for the liver and also reduce um, utter edema. This is a list of substances that are actually synthetics that have been approved for use in the organic livestock industry. Uh, the substances include ethanol and isopropanol, basically as, as disinfectants, not necessarily as feed additives. Aspirin can be used to reduce inflammation, just as it's being used in the conventional industry. Most vaccines are allowed. Chlorhexidine can be used as a teat dip uh, germicide. There are a variety of chlorine type products that can be used to disinfect and to sanitize facilities and equipment including calcium um, hypochlorite, chlorine dioxide, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, electrolytes are also allowed so if you have a scouring calf it's important that you use electrolytes to try and rehydrate that animal. Flunixin used as an analgesic glucose, dextrose in the case of a down cow can be used. Glycerin uh, can be used as a teat dip ingredient. Hydrogen peroxide, iodine, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium sulfate, and oxytocin are all allowed type substances. 
There are several dewormers that are found on the national list of allowed synthetics for organic livestock. These include fenbendazole, ivermectin, and moxidectin. These compounds are prohibited in slaughter stock and only allowed in emergency situations for dairy cattle and breeder stock where the organic system plan basically failed to prevent the infestation from occurring. Milk and milk products from treated animals can't be labeled as organic for a full 90 days following treatment. And in breeding stock, the treatment of these compounds can't be used during the last third of gestation or during the lactation if the offspring are to be used for slaughter. Let's talk a little bit about cow comfort. Um, housing has a big impact on cow comfort and her um, ability to resist disease. Housing types vary within the industry. We have pasture type systems with run-in sheds or natural shade. We have freestall systems. We have hoop barns with deep bedding pack and a variety of different greenhouse type constructions that have served as uh, shelter for organic dairy cows. The housing conditions are very important to, to disease prevention. Dirty conditions or poor ventilation will stress the immune system and will make the cow more susceptible to disease. It's also important to note that in a, an organic production plan, uh, during the grazing season, any animal over six months of age must have pasture, must be on pasture, must be actively grazing. And during the non-grazing season, they must have daily um, outdoor access and exercise, unless, of course, one of the exemptions applies. In production system plans where cows do need to be confined for a, a period of time, good air exchange is really important. You can't undersell the importance of, of good ventilation. Fresh air should enter the barn and move that warmer, contaminated air out of the barn. The Temperature difference between the outside and the inside during the winter months should be no more than about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Flooring is also an important consideration. Dry pasture that's free of small stones is really the ideal surface for cows. Standing on hard concrete all day is uh, very hard on them. Uh, it can cause hoof damage, strains their feet and legs. We also need to avoid slick concrete floors so the cows don't slip and they can feel real secure um, as they display their natural heats. A lot of riding behavior during that period of time. Concrete floors should be grooved um, or rubber mats should be used in order to enhance cow comfort and to provide good footing. These grooves should be about a half inch deep and a half inch wide and spaced about two to three inches apart to prevent slippage. Access to feed and water is another important consideration for cow comfort. Cows that are housed in tie stalls and stanchions have their own assigned bunk space for feeding. In freestall situations, however, that's not necessarily the case. Cows have free access to the feed bunk, and they do need about 30 inches of bunk space per cow in order that we have adequate space. If you have less than that, you'll see that the subordinate cows tend to fall off. They don't have the access to the feed. And you'll see a drop in body condition. You'll also see a drop in milk production. Daily water requirements for dairy cows vary with the weather, the type of feed they're on, and their level of production. A typical 1,500-pound cow that's producing 40 pounds of milk on a 40-degree day requires 18 gallons of water. On an 80 degree day, she requires 25 gallons of water. It's going to be important that we have adequate numbers of water troughs um, spaced throughout the dairy. So the number, the size, and the spacing of your water access points are really critical to cow comfort. Cows actually prefer to spend much of their day lying down, 12 to 14 hours or so. And as they do, blood flow through the udder increases by 30% or so, therefore increasing milk production. Time spent lying in a stall also increases the rumination and it rests her feet and legs. So if, if these freestall systems are being used, it's really important that these stalls are properly designed. There are a number of good design um, patterns out there that um, you can use, one of which is posted here on, on this particular slide. Properly designed stalls will allow a cow to have the freedom to lunge forward and to move from side to side while they get up and when they get down. And they shouldn't be so wide that the cow can actually turn sideways within the stall. That would prevent you from being able to keep that stall very you know, nice and clean. So sanitation is an important consideration. This is a great example of a deep bedded pack hoop barn structure for dairy cow housing. 
It's a, a system that provides a lot of space, resting space, for dairy cows. This type of facility is also quite economical, and you can use a variety of different types of bedding materials, sawdust, straw, shavings, or that type of thing. There are a number of different designs out there. We've attached one such plan um, to this website from the University of Minnesota Extension. Bedding material is essential for cow comfort and for cleanliness, and they basically fall into two different subcategories. The organic type, like straw, sawdust, rice hulls, and the inorganic, like sand and gypsum. The choice of the bedding material for your farm really depends on your manure handling system. It also depends on the availability of these substances, their price, and then your personal preference. You also need to keep in mind that within the NOP, I think it's section 205.239, requires that if roughages are being used as bedding that they must be certified as organic, and that's because there is the potential for that uh, bedding material to be ingested by the animal. It's also important to remember that if you're using an inorganic bedding like sand, that bacterial numbers can really soar into the millions if it's contaminated with manure or milk or feed or urine. So any bedding can be acceptable if the stalls are groomed regularly and if fresh clean bedding is applied on a regular basis. This particular table shows um, a number of different types of bedding materials with their advantages and their disadvantages. Well-maintained pastures are nature's perfect housing, complete with great footing, super ventilation, lots of sunshine to enhance animal health. You know, it's no wonder that the grazers refer to pasture-based housing as Dr. Green. On the other hand, it poorly maintained pastures can have severe negative impacts on animal health and actually increase the risk of disease. And care should be taken to fence off wet areas like creeks and ponds and swampy sections of your paddocks so that the cows don't stand in, in water or lie down in mud. Shaded pasture areas that become contaminated can harbor millions of mastitis causing bacteria if you're not actively rotating cows um, within a pasture setting. Let's switch the discussion to fresh cow management. The management of the fresh cow does begin as a dry cow, making sure that um, her nutrition is adequately balanced during that period of time. The length of the dry period is really a, an important consideration. It should be long enough more than 45 days so that the udder can dry off completely and can also heal, but not too long that you um, start to deposit fat into the udder, so not longer than 60 days. And rather than sending that dry cow to the back 40 and forgetting about them, they really need to be carefully monitored. As these cows come fresh, they're really quite fragile and they need to be monitored quite closely uh, to try and detect any abnormality or issues um, that you can address the earlier you address any fresh cow problems, the better it will go for that cow. Diseases and problems happen on every dairy farm, but <clears throat> if fresh cow problems increase in number, then your entire system has to be reviewed. Changes need to be made so that you can prevent these problems into the future. This table shows some of the very common fresh cow issues and problems, like milk fever, grass tetany, ketosis, displaced abomasum, and then of course metabolic acidosis. All of these diseases have um, basic nutrition and management at their core. So all of them can be prevented with adequate measures. Let's move on to diseases of the teats and external udder. Weather and housing conditions, bedding and infectious disease affect the outside surface of the udder and the teats. These types of diseases can affect milking or harbor types of bacteria that result in new mastitis cases. So here are some examples of external udder and teat disease problems. Uh, mammalitis caused by a herpes virus can be controlled or treated with chlorhexidine. Warts caused by papillomavirus, it's very contagious and has to be removed surgically. There are vaccinations or vaccines that are available with variable results and uh, can be managed perhaps with chlorhexidine dips. Then there's udder rot, uh, cause of which is unknown. Uh, contributing factors to udder rot is udder edema, mange mites. Udder shape itself, the physical shape of the udder may lend itself to udder rot. Treatment would be to basically scrub it with an antiseptic soap like iodine or chlorhexidine, dry the area as much as possible, calendula salve, 
raw honey. Those are the kinds of things that you can try to manage the situation. Probably the most common disease on any dairy, conventional or organic, is mastitis. Mastitis is an inflammation of the mammary gland in response to injury. Usually this injury occurs via infection by a microorganism, most commonly bacterial, but can also occur due to physical or chemical trauma that happens on the dairy and to the udder. There are two basic classifications of the degree of the mastitis inflammation. There's clinical and subclinical. Clinical mastitis is where we see visible changes in the milk. And in the udder, we might see redness or swelling. There's probably some pain. In the milk itself, we're seeing some clots and some flakes in the milk, most commonly caused by environmental type bacteria. Subclinical, me subclinical mastitis, on the other hand, doesn't show any physical changes in the udder or in the milk, but large increases in microscopic cells and bacteria happen within the milk. And you can detect that um, with a cell counting device or um, you know, CMT, California mastitis test. Contagious mastitis commonly causes subclinical mastitis. For every one case of clinical mastitis in a herd, you probably have between 15 and 40 cases of subclinical. Here are some common causative organisms for contagious mastitis. These would include Streptococcus agalactia, or strep ag, Staphylococcus aureus, or Staph aureus, which is a serious problem in the dairy industry, mycoplasma, and then the cornybacterium, all of which constitute sources of contagious type mastitis on a dairy. In addition to the more contagious type mastitis organisms, we have um, environmental type mastitis that are caused by um, organisms that are picked up um, in the environment. These would include Streptococcus uberus, Streptococcus dysgalactia, we have environmental staphylococci, we have E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Serratia, Arcanobacterium, and Prototheca species. All of these are organisms that basically just get picked up from the environment, get into the teat, and can create mastitis. Management of mastitis in a herd should focus on preventing new infections rather than treating infections that have already occurred. Mastitis basic management strategies might look something like this. Before you actually attach the milking units, wash or pre-dip those teats and then wipe them clean with single-use towels. Force strip each of the udders into a cup or into the gutter. Um, it, it stimulates the milk letdown and then also helps to identify any abnormalities that might be in that milk before you actually attach the milking unit. Use nitrile or latex gloves. Gloved hands are a lot easier to disinfect between cows, particularly when they become contaminated, when your hands become contaminated with milk or manure. Milking order is important. Always milk cows with contagious mastitis last. Overmilking. Make sure that your machines are not damaging the teats by overstripping the udders at the time of milking. That will cause cracks in the teat ends that are more likely to be colonized by Staph aureus. Also use post-milking teat dips. By applying uh, a teat dip immediately after milking, you're going to kill whatever bacteria were left on the teat ends by the inflations, and you'll also protect the teat end while it closes. Those sphincter muscles take a little time to close, and a post dip will close that, uh, preventing bacteria from climbing in um, prior to closure. Mastitis management should include some regular equipment maintenance. Your equipment, your milking system, should be evaluated a couple times a year by a qualified individual that can evaluate the mechanical system and perform some dynamic testing while the system is actually in operation. You need to also replace the liners. These rubber liners need to be replaced every 800 cow milkings or every 60 days, whatever comes first. The rubber used longer than this really deteriorates and it develops these microscopic cracks and ridges that will hold on to that mastitis bacteria, even through the wash cycle. Another consideration in your mastitis management plan is your dry cow program. Organic dairy production doesn't allow for the use of dry cow antibiotics or any kind of external or internal teat sealant. However, the dry period is a very important time for udder health improvement and for rejuvenation of the milking tissue. So 
It's recommended to reduce feed intake one week before dry off to decrease the overall production in the udder. Dip the teat in with teat dip twice daily for a week or so after the dry off period to try and disinfect the teat in on a regular basis. Feed adequate amounts of selenium and vitamin E during the dry off. And then keep the dry cow housing and bedding very clean and very dry. Hygiene is absolutely essential. This is an example of a natural mastitis treatment protocol that was put together by Dr. Paul Detloff, a respected uh, holistic organic dairy practitioner in the Midwest. Dr. Paul would recommend delivering vitamin C, IV, 30 to 50 cc's initially at the uh, initiation, followed by 30 to 50 cc's of vitamin C delivered subcutaneously every 12 hours thereafter. He would also recommend aloe vera as a drench, 300 cc's orally every 12 hours, some echinacea tincture and some garlic tincture delivered orally or in the vulva. If it's high enough quality, it could certainly go IV. Liniment um, should be applied to the udder. Um, that liniment is composed of essential oils and it should be rubbed and massaged all over the udder twice a day. Homeopathy can also be applied. Dr. Paul would recommend Phytolaca, 10 pills of the 30C, delivered in the vulva or under the tongue every two hours for a couple of days. And naturally, you're not going to be able to do that 24 hours a day, but every two hours throughout your day for the first two days. And naturally, um, the most important thing is to strip uh, that uh, infected quarter multiple times throughout the day. This is another example of a type of natural mastitis treatment protocol. It's called a phytomast infusion tube. This is a botanical paste that's actually infused up into the infected quarter. It's used very similar to what is uh, known as the antibiotic infusion tubes in the conventional industry. Uh, currently, this particular product is being tested or has been tested at Aurora Dairy in Colorado, North Carolina State, Michigan State, and the University of Vermont. After mastitis, reproductive problems are usually the second biggest headache for dairy producers, both conventional and organic. But a systemic approach can help you solve many of these kinds of problems. This is a brief summary of some of the major bovine reproductive problems that, that occur on any dairy, including organic. That would be anestrous cows or cows that fail to show heat, cystic ovaries where we have you know, large cysts on the ovaries that, that persist longer than 10 days at a time, persistent CLs. We have retained placentas, where it's the failure of the placenta to remove itself within 24 hours of calving. Metritis, which is an infected discharge that uh, lasts for more than two weeks post-calving. Pyometra are severe infections within the uterus itself. Repeat breeders, or cows that return to estrus with or after three or more inseminations. And then, of course, the abortions, um, which is the loss of calf between 42 and 260 days of gestation. There are a number of different types of alternative reproductive therapies that are available to treat these kind of scenarios. Um, they are not scientifically evaluated or appropriate for all farms. So make sure you consult an appropriate reference um, at the um, that should be found within the reading material of this module uh, for specific instructions as to how to approach each of these situations with a natural therapy. In general, there is homeopathy that can be used. From a botanical perspective, we've seen wild yams and black cohosh being used uh, to induce heat in anesthetic cows. There are herbal antibiotic tinctures that are useful for pyometra and for metritis scenarios and uh, a whole host of other kinds of treatment regimes that we'll go into in more detail in an advanced module on reproductive management in organic herds. This is an example of what a cystic ovary would look like. Cysts can take two forms. They can be follicular or luteal. Typically, you'd like to have these structured ruptured. The follicular cysts tend to rupture a little easier than the luteal cysts do. One form of treatment for cystic cows in an organic dairy herd would, would be homeopathy. The recommendation is uh, for 30C aphismel twice a day for five days, followed by natrum mur 30C twice a day for three days. This is an example of a retained placenta. 
where the afterbirth is retained by the uterus post calving. Could be the result of dystocia, calving difficulty, or it could be a nutritional deficiency. It's important not to pull or to tug on these retained placentas because it could result in some scarring of the endometrium that could have a negative impact on her subsequent pregnancy. If the cow is fresh, it's possible to put some iodine pills or a suitable uterine bolus inside the uterus to help treat a retained placenta. Make sure that these products are acceptable to your certifier. Another approach that we have used is basically a uterine flush where we infuse aloe, aloe vera juice mixed with garlic tincture and caliphylum. And we do this every day, twice a day would be ideal for as long as it takes in order to clean up the retained placenta. Hoof health and lamenesses are a big concern in today's dairy industry, and they are typically related back to management. Contributing factors include nutrition, walking surfaces, uh, cow comfort in terms of their stalls and where they lounge, genetics, cleanliness, sanitation of course, and biosecurity because many of these kinds of uh, lamenesses are in fact contagious. On conventional farms, lamenesses have actually been on the rise, particularly in the last 20 years as intensification has increased. Because organic cows are managed less intensively, they tend to be more extensive out on pasture, we see fewer lamenesses in organic dairy herds. Lamenesses in the dairy industry are typically caused either by you know, infectious agents or things in the environment, otherwise known as non-infectious type um, lameness issues. The infectious type fall into two categories. That would be digital dermatitis or hairy heel wart, and then interdigital necrobacillosis, which is foot rot. Both of those types of lameness issues are caused by a bacteria, which makes them both very infective. And um, certainly there are things in the environment that can predispose an animal uh, to becoming infected with either hairy heel wart or foot rot. So we'll talk more about how to treat those issues in a moment. The non-infectious agents include things like laminitis, which is an issue with the ration. Typically, laminitis is caused by um, ruminal acidosis from high grain diets. Sole ulcers and bruises are typically caused by mechanical injury, could be from poor lane design, too many rocks in your pasture, that type of thing. And then we have white line disease, where we have swelling and hemorrhage of the area of the heel bulb. And that too can be a diet related issue, but typically related to, you know, um, too wet of an environment or b bad management. The best way to treat hairy foot water, hairy heel wart organically, of course, is to not contract the disease, um, which is all about preventative medicine with adequate nutrition, sanitation, and a highly mineralized soils and highly mineralized cattle. And that will prevent a lot of hairy foot wart on your farm. And of course, biosecurity. Don't bring in cattle that have that um, organism on them. So, once it is in the herd, then it's a matter of trying to control it. Uh, to treat a hairy foot wart organically, um, I, I like the protocol that was developed by Dr. Hugh Carriman in the Barn Guide to Treating Dairy Cows Naturally. In this protocol, you basically remove the dry layer that covers the lesion and scuff off any additional tissue that uh, might be associated with the abrasion so that you get right down to the raw tissue. Make up a paste of about a half cup granulated sugar mixed in with some betadine. The iodine is really the key component there. The sugar will draw out um, a lot of the, the moisture associated with the, with the abrasion. Lather that area up with the paste, wrap it with vet wrap, and then continue to monitor it. So um, you will need to change that out periodically depending upon the environment that the cow is in. And this seems to work um, quite well on hairy heel wart. Treating foot rot organically is a bit like treating hairy heel wart. Although foot rot tends to erupt in between the toes and hairy heel wart obviously comes out on the rear end of the, or the back end of the foot. And when treating foot rot organically, it's important to completely clean and disinfect the area as much as possible. So remove all dirt and debris and then apply a liberal amount of hydrogen peroxide to bubble out the infection. And at that point, you can apply the same sugar betadine paste that I spoke on in the earlier slide. 
Apply it in a very liberal amount and then wrap the entire area. Monitor this wrap and as it deteriorates you have to get the cow back in and completely redo that same um, system until the cow is, is basically healed. Another thing to consider when you do have these infectious agents on your farm is to put in copper sulfate foot baths so that the cow or cows will be immersed in copper sulfate. It does tend to help reduce the number of infections. Flies are not only a nuisance, but they can also impact farm profitability through reduced production and the spread of disease. Biting flies are capable of increasing milk production or decreasing milk production rather by 15 to 30 percent. So because organic production prohibits the use of synthetic insecticides, organic farmers must take a multifaceted approach to insect control. Face flies, horn flies, and stable flies tend to be the most common. Face flies, of course, localize on the animal's face. Any more than 10 per animal creates a production loss. They also irritate the eyes and they spread pink eye. Horn flies tend to localize on the back and on the abdomen. Any more than 50 flies per animal, you'll see a production loss. Stable flies like to localize on the legs. S shouldn't see any more than 10 per animal. Um, in, in more ideal scenarios. These flies tend to have a very rapid life cycle, anywhere between 10 days and, and 3 weeks, and the females will lay almost 400 eggs, 500 eggs in a lifetime. They do like to lay their eggs in dirt and manure, so try to keep your feeding areas and your headquarter area as clean as possible to, to remove any type of organic matter that would serve as a medium for egg laying. Creating a carefully thought out fly control problem and then instituting it early in the fly season is really essential for success with fly control. No single step is going to control the flies. Instead, you really need to have this integrated management plan approach. So here is a best management practice for fly control. First and foremost, start early in the season. One female can lay 400 eggs, and so if you wait until you notice a problem, it's going to be way too late. Keep your pastures and your barns clean and dry and free of manure. Flies like to breed in this stuff. So keep it clean and you'll reduce the uh, places where these flies can breed. Use pheromone traps and sticky tapes. We use a variety of these kinds of products throughout the headquarter areas, in the parlor, in the barn. And it, it basically captures the adult flies. Release parasitic wasps. These insects feed on fly larvae. They can be released regularly throughout the entire fly season, and they do a nice job. Use essential oils and botanicals. These are available from a variety of organic supply companies and can be used as a, another step in fly control on your farm. But make sure that they're approved by your certifier before you purchase the product. Another thing that you might want to try is hydrated lime or diatomaceous earth. You can use hydrated lime in your calf areas or where you have um, some concentrated manure. Um, diatomaceous earth can be dusted on top of the hair coats of cows. It also is a, a, a retardant. Um, it actually reduces the amount of um, flies that are, will locate themselves directly on the animal. All of these kinds of practices are very helpful and they work well when, when used in concert. Ringworm, lice, and warts are diseases of the skin and are usually contagious. They affect the cow comfort and production and are more commonly seen during the winter months when the cows are housed inside or more closely together. Ringworm is caused by a fungus, tends to cause these circular grayish type um, crusty areas on the skin or on the, on the hair coat. They can be managed or ringworm can be managed by by sunlight, providing the cow with access to sunlight, some fresh air, some additional trace mineral and vitamin supplementation. Certainly uh, try a little uh, tincture of iodine or tea tree oil um, on those um, circular areas. Lice can be biting or sucking type lice. They do decrease the production and cause anemia. Typically they're caused by overcrowding and poor nutrition. So uh, remedy both of those scenarios, uh, provide access to self-groomers, and it can be treated with hydrated lime or sulfur dust bags. There's also some botanicals that might work in this situation. Warts are caused by papillomavirus. Uh, you can find them anywhere on, uh, on the body. Typically, time will take care of, of warts. There are vaccines that can be used in, in the face of a, a serious infest, infestation. 
Infectious bovine keratoconjunctivitis is caused by a bacteria called Moraxella bovis. This disease is otherwise known as pink eye. Conditions that irritate the eye or the surrounding area, like flies or dust or viruses, will create a condition that will allow Moraxella bovis to infect the eye. The initial signs include tearing, redness, swelling, sensitivity to light, the animal will be squinting. Then there's a cloudy area that appears on the surface of the eye that gradually spreads. And if it's allowed to go forward, the eye may actually bulge or even rupture. Conventional farms inject these, uh, these eyes with antibiotics, and obviously we can't do that with organic. So we must manage our way around this um, particular disease. There are several things that you can do to try and control or treat um, pink eye in organic herds. First and foremost is really to, to follow good grazing practices to prevent stubble and seeds from injuring the eye. Consider vaccinating before fly season starts. There are some really good pink eye vaccines available, which, which in my opinion have worked well in our herd. Make sure that nutrition is adequate, um, particularly prior to and during the weaning process. You know, this is very stressful on the calf. Make sure that you have adequate energy and adequate protein in the ration as you wean the animal off milk and on to, to dry feed. For irritation, uh, for extremely irritated eyes, you might want to put an eye patch over the top while it heals. Uh, some uh, dairymen have used um, calendula eye wash um, to spray into the eye twice a day. It does kind of relieve the swelling and the pain. Uh, we've also noticed that vetricin spray has been approved by some certifiers um, in, in the area and has been used as a spray for pink eye. Internal parasites can be an issue for organic herds, primarily because animals on pasture are naturally at a higher risk of infestation by internal parasites. So in your organic system plan, you need to develop a grazing management strategy that's going to minimize the potential for infection and then transfer among you know, the age groups on your farm. Nematodes tend to be the most common type of intestinal worm that affects cattle. Um, they include the brown stomach worm, or Ostertagia, and the barber pole worm, Homonchus contortus, and then Cuparia. These larvae tend to overwinter inside cattle and then begin to mature and produce eggs in the springtime, which are shed back into the feces. You can see by the diagram here on this slide how this life cycle works. The immature worm develops in the gut wall and then later mature in the gut to start producing those eggs. They damage the gut wall in the process and begin shedding eggs. The eggs are uh, produced and shed into the manure. They hatch into larvae. The first and second stage larvae mature there. And then as they morph into the third stage larvae, they migrate up onto the grasses where other animals come along and eat them and begin the process all over again. An internal parasite infestation may be clinical where you can see the visible signs or subclinical where you cannot see the outward signs of an internal infestation. Clinical infections tend to be more common in the young cattle and calves. They may have diarrhea, poor weight gain, pot bellies, rough and discolored hair coats, swelling underneath the jaw like a bottle jaw. In subclinical infestations, which tend to be most common in the adult cattle, Diarrhea is fairly rare, but the worms do in fact negatively impact milk production and body condition. Adult cattle can develop some level of immunity to internal parasites. Organic farmers manage nematodes really through their best management practices and treat them with some alternative type therapies. The NOP does allow synthetic dewormers. Uh, such as fenbendazole, ivermectin, and moxidectin, but only in emergency situations in which the dairy cattle cannot be designated for organic slaughter stock. Routine dewormers can't be used. Instead, an organic system plan has to be put into place to reduce their exposure and to reduce their load. These management steps were outlined in the pasture management um, module and you can refer to that module uh, to uh, reassess those, those important steps. There are alternative therapies for nematode control. There are a few herbal remedies that are available to, to treat 
internal parasite infestations, but these may not be scientifically evaluated or appropriate for all farms. And make sure that you consult a reference um, recommendation to uh, determine whether or not that particular product is going to work um, for your situation. And also make sure that that product is also approved by your third-party certifier. Bovine coccidiosis is caused by emerii. These are tiny one-celled organisms. Most of the negative effects of coccidiosis occur in very young animals, heifers and calves. And the infestations are characterized by a pretty severe diarrhea, often with blood weight loss, anemia, and dehydration. Death is usually due to dehydration or secondary bacterial infections. The severity of the symptoms directly relate to the number of oocysts that were ingested. So the more contaminated or less hygienic an area, the greater the risk of oocyst exposure. Overcrowding, diet, changes in uh, location, shipping stress, all of these things can cause an outbreak because you basically weaken the immune system and that is your primary defense. Follow the same best management practices um, used to prevent scours. Um, the three currently approved synthetic dewormers are in fact not effective on coccidiosis so you will need to be looking at some other alternative type treatments. Now, these alternative treatments may not be appropriate for every farm, and you do need to seek guidance in terms of what types of products you can use in, in this situation. Uh, garlic, black walnut hulls, and wormwood have been used to treat coccidiosis. The latter two products, the walnut hulls and the wormwood, are high in tannic acids, which tend to work well on, on these organisms intestine, in, within the intestine. But again, um, you'll have to consult with your herd health um, specialist to determine what the best product would be to treat your animals. Coccidia have a very complex life cycle. The oocysts, or the eggs, are shed in feces. These oocysts are really quite hardy and they survive for months in moist areas, particularly where sunlight and ventilation is minimal. They are unaffected by common disinfectants. The oocysts change their life stage in the environment and then they are ingested by calves. So inside the calf intestine, the oocyst will release its, its sporozoite that burrows into the intestinal wall where it causes the damage. And this is where you get some of that bleeding. Inside the intestinal wall, they undergo a few more life changes. And eventually, they release more oocysts into the feces and into the environment. Once ingested, an oocyst ultimately results in an, in an additional 20 million oocysts that get shed into the environment. So you can see why they are very prolific and very difficult to get rid of. A type of non-infectious disease that is fairly common on dairies is called hardware disease, also known as traumatic reticuloperitonitis, which results from a cow swallowing a foreign object, usually it's metal, and it lodges itself within the reticulum. The rumen contractions eventually cause that object to punch a hole in the reticulum and it creates inflammation and infection. Signs of hardware disease vary with the level of inflammation and the infection. Cows can have objects in their stomachs for years that go undetected until slaughter. Cows with perforations may walk around with an arched back. They may be somewhat reluctant to eat. Other symptoms include a slowed or an absent rumen contraction, fever, or a positive wither pinch test where you pinch the backbone of the cow at the withers and she might grunt or make um, a, a vocalize a sound of some type. If the object is actually penetrated and cause an infection around the heart, you're going to hear some abnormal heart sounds when you use a stethoscope. You may be um, able to see that. The pulse in the jugular vein is also a way to kind of pick that up. If severe signs are present, fever and pain, antibiotics and possibly surgery may be in order. If antibiotics are used, the animal has to be removed from the organic production system. This disease can be prevented um, and mild cases can be treated by administering magnets to cattle and then ensuring that the cow doesn't have access to foreign material in the bunks or in the pasture. Bloat is another type of digestive disorder that is non-infectious. It's caused by an accumulation of gas in the cow's rumen. It usually falls within one of two categories. There is either frothy bloat or gassy bloat. In mild cases, the cow will belch and release the gas. 
But um, sometimes there's an abnormal amount of fermentation that has occurred and gas fills up the rumen. It gets to the point where there's so much pressure within the rumen on blood vessels that it restricts the, the breathing. If the condition is not treated, she'll die. Bloat does occur more often in young animals <clears throat> that have been exposed to lush legume pastures, particularly clover-based pastures. Moisture on these uh, types of forages, like rain or dew, will increase the occurrence of bloat, particularly in the springtime or in the early summer because of the rapid fermentation of these highly digestible forages. They uh, produce an excess of gas in the rumen. This happens because of and this soluble protein is produced um, and it's attacked by slime producing type bacteria and the slime forms a very stable protein foam and the gas accumulates underneath this layer and then the cow simply can't expel the gas. Prevention, basic, allow the uh, cattle to have gradual access to legume pastures a few hours at a time and then pull them off. Feed them dry hay in the barn before you turn them out and avoid turning cattle out on any wet or dewy, dewy legume pastures. Always allow the sunlight to dry it first. Treatment of bloat in an organic herd can take the form of, of poloxylene, which is only allowed in the form, it's only allowed in emergency situations for bloat. It's not allowed as a preventative measure. This product is basically pumped into the rumen and it decreases the amount of foam that's being produced and so it'll allow her to eructate. Um, for mild bloat, remove the cow from the pasture and feed her some dry hay. For severe cases, you may want to pass a stomach tube to try and, and allow some of that gas to escape. For life-threatening emergencies, you may need to punch a hole in the rumen with a trocar and certainly having a veterinarian around to do that particular procedure is always a wise move. Adult respiratory disease is another major economic drain on organic dairy farms. It causes a lot of loss of production, it increases labor costs, creates premature culling, and often death. Upper respiratory disease, or URD, affects the nostrils, the throat, and the windpipe. Pneumonia, or lower respiratory tract disease, affects the bronchial tree and the lungs. A variety of causes is responsible and it's often triggered by stressful environmental factors. Stressors would include humidity, dust, dehydration, irritating gases from manure buildup, and of course nutritional deficiencies. Abrupt weather changes, cattle transport, and poorly ventilated barns may also lead to respiratory disease outbreaks. The signs of respiratory disease indicate whether the upper or the lower tract is affected and the severity of the disease as well. URD can be characterized by discharge from the nose and eyes, coughing, and loud sounds while breathing. Signs of pneumonia include fever, depression, lack of appetite, and an increased breathing rate, often coughing. And of course, death would also be a primary symptom of this disease. Best management practices for adult respiratory disease include improving the ventilation. Cows that are out on pasture are at a very low risk for respiratory disease as opposed to cows that are in poorly ventilated barns. If you have the latter, make sure that you have adequate fan, fans installed into these barns to improve airflow inside those barns. And you can also retrofit many of the older barns with, with tunnel type ventilation systems. Vaccination is another great way to manage this particular disease. If respiratory disease is a problem on your farm, or if you plan to bring new cattle onto your farm, consider vaccinating both the home herd and the new cattle. Vaccination should include IBR, PI3, BVD, types 1 and 2, BRSV, Pasteurella, and Haemophilus somnus. Early in the herd outbreak, vaccinations or boostering with an intranasal vaccine can be very, very helpful. Also keep in mind that feed quality can lend itself to adult respiratory disease. Dust from poor quality haze can increase the risk of respiratory disease in a whole host of ways. Dust, possibly including some mold spores, can act as a physical irritant on the respiratory system and may trigger allergic reactions and some non-infectious pneumonia. Adult respiratory disease treatments would include Items like passive antibodies, although passive antibodies are not effective for viral type of pneumonias, 
They are effective for Pasteurella pneumonia, which is a bacterial-based pneumonia. Vitamin B and C injections, both of these types of vitamins are great antioxidants, and you can administer them both under the skin, subcutaneously, or in the vein, intravenously. Other practices would include delivering some anti-inflammatories like aspirin or flunixin. Used, these products are used to reduce fever and to prevent damage to the lungs. And as a last resort, antibiotics can be used. Um, in cases where calves do not respond to any of the above treatments, you must give them antibiotics to prevent their suffering. You must permanently remove these animals once they're treated with antibiotics from the production system, from the organic production system. There are some other alternative type therapies for adult respiratory disease, and keep in mind that they may not be appropriate for every farm and you need to consult um, a health professional um, prior to their use and make sure that these products are also approved by your certifier. There are some herbal antibiotic tinctures that are fairly effective um, for adult respiratory disease, such as garlic. Garlic has 28 active compounds within um, that particular uh, tincture and, and could be quite useful in the face of that kind of an infection. Homeopathy can also be used and essential oils, in particular eucalyptus essential oil is really quite effective in, in helping um, with um, the upper respiratory type diseases. Vaccines are a great part of a preventative uh, medicine program on your farm. The National Organic Program does allow for vaccinations and it's strongly recommended for open herds where animals come and go off of a dairy, like show animals for a fair, or if you have animals that you board elsewhere and then you bring home again. Those are the kinds of scenarios where you can bring um, infectious agents back onto your farm. And it's always cheaper and healthier for animals and your farm budget if the farm can prevent disease at the get-go. And that's exactly what a vaccine is designed to do. So how do they work? Well, vaccines stimulate the cow's own immune system against a particular type of disease that may be present or may be later introduced into your herd. So you should really discuss this kind of a thing with your herd veterinarian. They're likely to know what types of disease your herd is susceptible to in your region. And there isn't any one-size-fits-all vaccine program for every dairy. So your farm is going to be unique. It'll have a unique disease history. It'll have some you know, unique aspects of it that really require some specificity with which you design your vaccine program. No vaccine program can protect all of the animals all of the time. The goal is to build a level of herd immunity so that the disease can't spread to susceptible animals. If a disease is introduced into an unvaccinated herd, 100% of those animals are susceptible. So the disease can spread from the initially sick animal throughout the entire herd. Some are going to get sick, some may die, others hopefully will survive and develop an immunity that will last, you know, a week or, or a lifetime, depending on the organism. However, when a disease infects a vaccinated herd, the herd already has a level of immunity that slows or even halts the spread of that disease. It may therefore never reach uh, the susceptible animals within the herd. That's the beauty of a vaccination program. There are a variety of different types of vaccines out on the market. There's the modified live, which is a type of vaccine that has a organism, a live organism that's been attenuated in some way. It um, creates a very strong immune response and usually requires just one vaccination to make it um, effective. A killed vaccine is an inactivated virus or an inactivated bacteria, so it will never reproduce within the body. It's safe for pregnant animals, but it does require a couple of doses, particularly initially. You need a, an initial dose and then a secondary dose in order to get adequate um, responses from the immune system. The immunity from a killed vaccine is not as strong or as long-lasting la as a modified live vaccine. An autogenous disease, uh, vaccine is a bacterial or viral vaccine that's produced from the organism or the tissue of the sick animal. So it's really designed specifically for your farm. It's used for very farm-specific diseases where a commercial vaccine just isn't available. And then there are nosodes, which are homeopathic remedies that are produced from diseased tissue or culture. It's also used as a preventative measure to stimulate natural immunity. 
And uh, the evidence would suggest that it's not effective in outbreaks. And currently, it's not legally recognized as an official method of vaccinations in uh, organic herds. Here are some diseases to include in your vaccination program. They're fairly common for dairy programs. In general, we vaccinate our herd for almost all of these types of diseases. Uh, at the top of the list, we have infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, parainfluenza, or PI3, bovine viral diarrhea, or BVD, and bovine syncytial virus, BRSV. And of course, bovine respiratory complex, which is a combination of organisms. Now, these vaccines typically come in a package and can be um, and used as a single vaccine, usually a modified live. Leptospirosis is a bacterin. It is a type of disease that causes a late stage abortion or bloody urine. And it is typically a killed vaccine and should be used as a dual vaccine where you have an initial dose and you have a booster to follow. Brucellosis is basically a one-time vaccine that is um, delivered by a, a certified veterinarian. We have colostridial vaccine, often a Bactrin, and again, requiring a, an initial dose and a booster. There are a variety of scour vaccines uh, for E. coli, corona, and rotaviruses that uh, prevent calf diarrhea. We typically give this vaccination to our dry cows so that we can get those antibodies in our colostrum for passive immunization for calves. We also have a pink eye vaccine, a vaccine for Moraxella bovis that uh, helps prevent uh, pink eye. We typically will do this in our young calves in a couple of doses. Again, it's a Bactrin, so it does require a, uh, a double dose, an initial and a follow-up booster. Then coliform mastitis. Um, coliform mastitis causes acute mastitis with fever, depression, and, uh, and really the cow goes systemic quickly and, and can die. So coliform mastitis is another vaccine that we would typically vaccinate our dry cows for. There's a couple of diseases that are particularly bad, no matter if it's conventional or organic, and one of those, of course, is yonis. So we've, we've set forth some best management practices to control yonis on, an, on a dairy. Yonis disease itself is caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium paratuberculosis. It's a chronic wasting disease of cattle, and it's highly contagious, and it's characterized by weight loss and diarrhea. Infected cattle shed the bacteria in their manure and may classify as light, moderately high, or super shedders, depending upon the number of bacteria per gram of manure that they're shedding at the time. It may only take a thimble full of contaminated manure from a heavy shedder to infect a calf. Here are some basic steps for all Yoni's disease control programs. First and foremost, you know, establish a Yoni's testing protocol on your farm and remove all positives. Small herds can do a fecal culture on all cattle older than two years of age. Larger herds may want to test just a subset of their animals um, that have been selected statistically from within the herd. Environmental screening, such as culturing pooled feces from concentrated cattle areas, can also be performed to basically assess your vulnerability and uh, your level of contamination to yonis. Prevent any fecal or oral spread of yonis wherever possible. Don't use manure-contaminated tools or equipment to handle feed. Make sure that those two things are very separate. Manure handling versus feeding equipment should be very separate. Prevent manure contamination of your watering areas. Prevent any runoff from adult areas into the calf areas because that's typically where the contamination is going to occur. Dedicate pastures for your young stock use only. Avoid that leader follower system because it will infect your younger stock if they are to follow your older cattle that may be shedding this organism. Don't walk in your feed areas with your manure covered boots. Feed and care for calves before you work, for the, work with the adult cattle so there isn't that level of cross contamination taking place. Additional BMPs to reduce yonis include managing your calves to break that cycle of transmission. You need to know the yoni status of the dam before she calves so that you can know whether or not to collect that colostrum from that cow. You only want to feed calves colostrum from milk from test negative cows only. In herds with yonis, make sure that the calves are not allowed to suck the cow 
um, prior to removing the calf at birth. It's important to prevent that uh, transmission from taking place if the calf does get up to suckle the cow. You can also access additional information on the Yoni's disease at these websites. Bovine leukemia virus is another contagious viral disease of cattle, also known as bovine leukosis or lymphosarcoma. Bovine leukemia virus is spread among cows through blood contact. Multiple use needles or rectal sleeves used for pregnancy palpation, dehorning equipment, and biting flies can all spread this disease. The dams can spread it to their calves through the colostrum and in their milk. Many cattle in the U.S. are infected, but only a small percentage, less than 5%, actually develop a cancer of the lymph nodes known as lymphosarcoma. Finding lymphosarcoma in slaughter cattle will result in that carcass being condemned at slaughter. To control BLV in your herd, you need to test and then remove any positives from your herd. Prevent any further spread within your herd by using single-use needles, change those rectal palpation sleeves between cows, and of course sanitize the dehorning equipment um, from one animal to the next. And then do your very best to control those biting flies because they are indeed a vector for the disease. Now we've really stressed preventative medicine throughout this entire module, but there will be things that happen on farm and you really need to be prepared for them when it does happen. Here are some items that should be included in your animal health toolbox for the organic farmer. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just wanted to talk about a couple of them. Aloe vera juice, for, sure, for instance, and colostral whey are really good nonspecific immunostimulants. When you have an animal that breaks with disease, you know their immune system is weak. So those are two products that can really help you boost their immune system. Aspirin is a great anti-inflammatory. Black walnut hulls if you're faced with an internal parasite infestation. Calcium gluconate is a great way to treat milk fever. And you really need to have that on hand because when it happens, you need to be able to IV that cow and treat her. A California mastitis test is a very inexpensive way to diagnose subclinical mastitis and it's best to diagnose that early so that you can use some of these alternative treatments to effectively treat that disease early. Garlic tincture is a great antibiotic and um, lidocaine as an anesthetic for dehorning. You might need to have some magnets on hand to prevent any type of hardware disease if you happen to see that oral electrolytes to, to rehydrate um, scouring calves, paloxylene in an emergency situation where you may end up with some bloat. A stomach tube is always great too if you need to relieve bloat or a rumen that is expanding with gas rapidly. It's another emergency situation that you just need to be prepared to handle and to manage. All of these items I think are great and should be on farm ready to go when you have a problem. The backbone of every organic farm is good record keeping so that you can verify your organic management practice. Animal health records are going to be required by your organic certifier and they're strongly recommended just as good business practice. Good records are going to help you make well-informed decisions about a variety of things, preventative health care, about your culling strategies, and, and even help you fine-tune your reproductive program. An example of a health record data form can be found appended to the chapter reading material within this module. Your certifier or your milk processor may have other record keeping templates as well that you might want to consider. Finally, the most important piece of record keeping is actually using the data that you collect and you can use that information to make some very sound financial and management decisions on your farm. What I have here on this final slide of the module are some of the essential components of a record keeping system for your herd health program. At a minimum, you'd need animal ID, birth date, the date of purchase, sire dam, lactation number, calving dates, milk production and components, the dates and outcome of, of any potential testing, treatments that would have been administered to the animal throughout her entire lifetime, and the date of her cull or sale or her death. Now we keep a lot more records than this on farm, but this is really the minimum amount of information that would be uh, needed uh, to meet your certification program. Anyway, this is the last slide within our module, and I hope that you have enjoyed the Herd Health module, and please consult any of the references or contacts if you have any further questions.